Good morning. Uh, welcome, all of you. Welcome to the, those of you joining us online. Uh, my name is Justin, and uh, today we are in a series on the book of Proverbs. And so we've been in this for the last few weeks. And, and as a church, um, the, the book of Proverbs is just full of all sorts of wisdom. So as a church, what we've been challenging ourselves to do is how can we take this and, and not make it just wisdom or knowledge that we have in our heads, but really how do we learn to apply it and to live it out in our lives? And, and as, I, as I was thinking about this week and, uh, and preparing for, for this, this Sunday, um, I realized that, man, sometimes I don't do a very good job of that. <laughs> and, and the truth of the matter is, um, I set out, I, I want to make wise decisions, and, and I hope I'm not alone in this, but I can think of unwise decisions I made this week. How many of you can think of some unwise decisions you made this week? If you don't have to raise your hand. You know? <laughs> or this month. Some of you guys, yeah, you're like, I only made one this month. Like, no, yeah, right. I, it's a struggle, isn't it? We know what we should do, but a lot of times we just don't do it. We know what's right, but sometimes where our feelings and our heart is leading us is not in the same direction. It's almost sometimes like there's these two minds that we have. There's the mind that knows, and then there's this other one that feels, and the two sometimes, they aren't working together, right? There's sometimes almost like a battle within us, warring against us. We know what we should do, but we just can't seem to do it. Now, the Bible actually talks about this. In the book of Romans, Paul, he says these words. I'll read, let me read this to you and see if you can relate to this. He says, I do not understand what I do. For what I want to do, I don't do it. But I, I do instead what I hate to do. I have the desire to do what is good, but, but I just can't carry it out. I do not do the good I want to do, but the evil that I don't want to do, yeah, that's what I do. <laughs> what a wretched man I am. Who will rescue me from this body that just seems like it's just subject to death? Like, it seems like this is just never going to work. I know what I should do, but I can't seem to be able to, to live it out. And it's a struggle that, if we're honest, that, that all of us, we've been there. And the truth of the matter is that sometimes, whenever you really get stuck in this struggle, sometimes you get there where you just like, forget it. Some, we, some, sometimes you use a stronger F word than that, but we just say, I'm done. And we just want to just give up, right? And, and I've seen people who, who at one point in time were really committed. They, they wanted to be here. They were excited because they were seeing that there's a lot of truth and, and it was changing them up here. But, but sometimes when we struggle and we can't just seem to apply it in our life, we just give up. And there's people that have given up on church. There's sometimes where, where we give up on relationships, we give up on our families, and oftentimes when we feel hopeless and, and powerless, it makes us want to give up, and, and I think that's where a lot of us are, and, and even Paul, is, he, he reads this in Romans, or as we read in Romans, he, he understands that. He says, who will rescue me from this body that's subject to death? But then he says this, he says, but thanks be to God who delivers me through Jesus Christ our Lord. That in the middle of this battle that we face, that there is rescuing. There is someone who can help. There is hope that this war, that are, that are what we know and what we feel in our hearts, that those two can actually come together, that there can be peace. And that's what we're really going to talk about today. And, and this peace between the head and the heart is something that God has been trying to impart in our lives from the very beginning. You see this from the beginning of the Bible all the way to the end. And we're going to talk a little bit about that, but we're specifically going to focus in Proverbs chapter 3. So if you have your Bibles with you, I would encourage you, pull it up. Follow along. Look at this. I'm going to talk on this, but I want you to really focus in on God's words. I want you to see him and hear him speaking through this. So, so really be focusing on that. But before we begin, would you just pray with me? Let's pray. Oh God, I just thank you for your word. Thank you that, that we have this opportunity to, 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 to focus and, and learn um, the secret to, to experiencing peace in our lives. Peace in this struggle that we all face where we know what we want to do, but we just don't do it, and we find ourselves making unwise decisions, and, and sometimes, God, we just want to give up, and God, we need your help. I mean, God, even as I stand up here and speak, I need your help. I, I need you to speak. I, I need your faithfulness to, to shine through in this message. Be with my words and be with our hearts, be with our minds as we listen to you. God, teach us. It's in Jesus' name I pray, amen. So Proverbs 3 
begins uh, with the words of Solomon, and he's speaking to his son. He's wanting to pass on some, some very important things to, to his son. But in many ways, this is almost like God speaking to him, his sons and daughters too. This is, this is God's wisdom. He wants to pass this and on to his, his children. And so this is what it says. It says, my son, do not forget my teaching, but keep my commands in your heart. For they will prolong your life many years and they will bring you peace and they will bring you prosperity. Peace and prosperity. It's interesting is that the outcome of, of this, right, is that, that long life, peace and prosperity. But isn't interesting that if you don't experience peace and prosperity, long life is not the thing that you want, right? But whenever there's peace between our head and our heart and we experience that, that peace in our lives, all of a sudden long life seems something that is, is prosperous. It's good. And it says, this is, he wants his son to experience this, but in order for this to happen, he says, my son, this is what I want you to do. First, don't forget. This is the knowledge part. Don't forget the teaching. But then he says, but that's not, it's more than that. You've got you to bring the teaching from the head, right? He says, I want you to keep my commands in your heart. Because that's what will prolong your life many years and bring you that peace and prosperity, to, to calm that war between your head and, and your heart. The Hebrew word for peace here, and it says peace and prosperity, it's just this one word, it's shalom. <laughs> now, you may have heard, seen it in a movie, it's a, it's, a, it's a greeting that Jews oftentimes will say to each other, shalom, but it's this idea of wholeness. It's, it's bigger than just peace, it's, 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 it's everything working together in the way that it should, within us and outside of us. So my son, don't forget my teaching, keep my commands in your heart, for they will prolong your life many years, bring you peace and prosperity. Let love and faithfulness never leave you. Bind them around your neck, your head, right, your neck. Write them on the tablet of your heart. Then you will win favor and a good name in the sight of God and man. It affects our relationship within us, but also with God and with others. And the word here for favor is the same word often translated in the Bible as grace. This is the undeserved favor of God at work in our lives, connecting us with God, bringing us peace, but also bringing us peace with each other. This is shalom. It's this wholeness that, that he's trying to, to bring about. And, and the secret, he wants his son to get this. This is what you got to hear. You got to let love and faithfulness never leave you. You got to let them just come into you, be on your head, be on your heart, love and faithfulness. And I think we read scriptures like this, let love and faithfulness, but we actually read it like this. You just need to be more loving and faithful, almost like a command, something that we need to do. As long as you are more loving and faithful, then you will experience this peace, and that's not what this says. This peace isn't something that you can just manufacture in your life by, by something that you do. You can't just make this happen. The word is let love. Let this be imprinted upon you. Let the faithfulness and love of God be imprinted on you. Now, as, as you read the Bible more and more, you, you'll get, begin to see certain things repeated over and over. And this characteristic of God is God being a loving and faithful God. It is repeated over and over throughout all of the Bible from the beginning to the end. One of the spots towards the beginning where this is said very clearly is in Exodus 34, 6. It says this, the Lord, the Lord, the compassionate the God who's deeply moved, compassion. He's, he's a gracious God, the compassionate and gracious God, right? It's defining the character of God. He's slow to anger, and then it says these words, abounding in love and faithfulness. So Solomon used these words on purpose because these are the characteristics of God. He wanted the characteristics of God to be Im impressed upon his son's heart. He says, if you want to experience peace in your life, then the character of God, his love and his faithfulness, they need to be impressed and stamped on your mind and on your heart. It's not something you can do. It's something that has to be done to you. As I was thinking about how I could communicate it this week, uh, I noticed my daughter uh, and her Play-Doh. <laughs> I thought, that's a good way for us to understand this, because how many of you grew up with Play-Doh? Anybody play with Play-Doh? 
So you can, you can interact with me here. I know you've all played with Play-Doh. You're like, whatever, I'm not going to, I'm not going to interact with that. But we've all seen this, right? You got Play-Doh and you can mold stuff with it. Anybody here like a Play-Doh master? You can just like craft the most amazing things. No. In truth, if I told you all to like craft me, like make me uh, an image of myself, it wouldn't look nothing like me. If I tried to make an image of myself, if I tried to make a, you know, a little picture of Jesus on the cross, it would look probably terrible. But the thing that I've seen that my daughter has, she has these like little Play-Doh stamps. Like Play-Doh's come a long way since when I was a kid, right? They had all these little tools that you use. And, and she takes these stamps and she pushes it into the Play-Doh and then the Play-Doh takes on that exact same shape. And it's a little bit of the idea that, that, that Solomon is trying to get across to his son. You need to let the character of God, his love and his faithfulness, press down on your life so it leaves an impression of that on your heart, on your mind. This isn't something that you just try and do harder. In fact, you cannot manufacture love and faithfulness in your heart. They have to be stamped there by God. But sometimes we think we can. In our own power, in our own wisdom, we can just do it. If I just try hard enough. No, no. We are at God's mercy. We need his help with this. We need help for this. And this is actually, it's not an abstract idea. It's actually something that we all get. It's something that we all understand because, because all of us have had ideas of love and faithfulness just stamped on our lives, not because of our hard work or anything we've done. They were just stamped there. All of you were born into families. You got parents. And, and you learned an example of love and faithfulness from them. You didn't choose that. <laughs> it wasn't your choice. It was just stamped on you. And that's the reason sometimes we get older, we're like, man, I'm just like my, my dad, or I'm just like my mom, because it's just there. It gets stamped on us. We, it's not within our control. That just happens, right? So there's other things that are stamped on us. Uh, a lot of you are, are from here in Ireland. We got some people from South Africa here. We got some from Brazil. We got people from all places. You didn't choose that. We got some people here from Dublin. Who would choose that, right? <laughs> but, but those things were just stamped on you. They were just stamped on your life. You didn't get to choose it. There's so many ways that our ideas of love and faithfulness and the things that have shaped our heart, they've just been stamped there. And you don't choose them when you're young, but as you get older, you do get to start to choose, right? So we talked about last week about the person that, that is your spouse or partner or the person that you choose. They, they have a big impact on your heart, and we are encouraged in wisdom and how we select that because as you, as you go, you get to, to choose that. And now he's bringing his son to, to, to point him towards a relationship that he wants him to focus on to leave this impression on his heart. This is what he says to him. He says, he says trust in the Lord with all your heart. And lean not on your own understanding. In all your ways, submit to him, acknowledge him, and he will make your path straight. He's drawing where if you want that impression on your heart, then you have to choose. The choice that we have in it is to choose to trust God, to choose to trust in his loving faithfulness. See, this, this loving kindness that, that he's, he's talking about, it's actually, there's two Hebrew words that he's using. The, the first word for, for loving is, is this word hesed. And it's, again, it's one, a word that's repeated over and over in the Bible. In Psalms, um, there's a psalm where it's repeated 26 times. His love endures forever. His love endures forever. It's this love that just is, it never gives up. And this faithfulness, it's, it's actually the word in Hebrew that's communicated this truth. This is the, the character of God, the whole truth from beginning to end. And it's a really interesting word. It's the word ameth. It's the same word that we get the word amen from. Amen actually means like truth. But it's, it's the Hebrew word that has the first letter of the Hebrew alphabet, the middle letter of the Hebrew alphabet, and the last letter of the Hebrew alphabet. It's the character of God, his truth from beginning to end. He wants that to be stamped, to impress on our life. And throughout all of history, he's been trying to encourage people, you can trust me, but we have to choose to trust him. But when we do, it can stamp on our lives. And when it stamps on our lives, it makes our path straight. But the truth of the matter is, is that a lot of things that are stamped on our heart, they aren't making our path straight, are they? <laughs> and, and this is why I was at, at Disneyland uh, not that long ago, and it, and it really stood out to me that at Disneyland, you see this message repeated over and over, just follow your heart and your dreams will come true. But it's actually something that's repeated over and over in our culture. Now, if, if God's heart is stamped on your heart, that, that's different, but, but the things that have been impressed on us are oftentimes leading us all over the place. And if you just follow your heart, it's going to take you everywhere. The culture says follow your heart, but Jesus says something different. Listen to the words of Jesus in Luke 
6, 45, he says this, the good person out of the good treasures of his heart produces good, but the evil person out of the evil treasures produces evil. For out of the abundance of the heart, the mouth speaks. This idea that, that whatever has been stamped or impressed on your heart is going to flow out. If it's God, that's going to flow out and it's going to make your path straight. But if it's not, you're still going to head in those directions. And, and, I, and I want you to think, though, really quick, because it talks about acknowledging what's been impressed on your heart. When you acknowledge the loving kindness of God being impressed on your heart, that makes your path straight. But the, you also sometimes need to acknowledge the other things that have been impressed on our hearts, right? So what are, I want you to think about that for a second. What are the things that have been imprinted on your hearts? What are the things that have been imprinted on your hearts from your parents? Some of you had great parents. Some of you, the idea of even looking to God as a loving father, that doesn't even make sense to you because that's not been your experience. And even if you had great parents, they weren't perfect. There's things that are impressed on your heart that you're living out that you don't realize because out of your heart, it just flows into your lives. Or what about from your family, your brothers, sisters, aunts, uncles, friends? Some of you had some incredible things impressed, but some of you also have some really painful things. I know some people who have been abused and hurt by family members. And those things, they get Im imprinted on our hearts. Or, or this is one that is real for a lot of people. I know a lot of people who have had some really incredible things implanted on the heart because of church or leaders in the church. But I know some of you have had things pushed down and impressed on your heart that it hurts. <laughs> but you, people have been betrayed, abused, hurt by the church. But the, the problem is, is that those things, they, they push down on our heart and they leave a print, but then they end up flowing out into our lives. Because whatever is impressed in our hearts flows out into our lives. There, there's a... a in, in, in the next chapter in, in Proverbs 4, um, put it up on the screen because I skipped through it in my notes, but I want to say this. It says, guard your heart. I'm throwing her off. I like to do that. Can't find it. But it basically says, guard your heart because it's going to come out in your life, right? You can look it up, do a Google search, you'll find it. But guard your heart because it's going to come out into your life. But here's the thing. All of us have had trust betrayed, and broken in our lives. We've all been hurt, it's been impressed upon us, and it ends up flowing out. But we don't want to acknowledge it. Usually you just want to shove it away. But here's the thing, and this is repeated over and over in Scripture. The only way to heal broken and betrayed trust is with faithful trust. It's not to push away. The only way to heal broken and betrayal is actually not to push away from trust, which is what we're all prone to do. When you touch something hot, you get burned, it hurts, you pull away. But God, his way that he heals broken trust is through faithful trust. It's through bringing you to a place and to people that you can trust. But ultimately, the goal is that you learn to trust in the Lord with all your heart. And lean not on your own understanding, but in all your ways, acknowledge him, and he will make your paths straight. But a lot of times, when we're hurt, what seems wise to us is to push away, <laughs> right? And, and, and Solomon knows this, because he's pretty wise, and he knows this is going to be evident in his son's life as, as well, and he says, you've got to fight against that. It's going to seem like the wise thing to you to, to, to push away, but, but this is what I want you to do, Solomon. And Solomon says to his son, he says, don't be wise in your own eyes, but have respect for the Lord and avoid evil. That is what will bring health to your body and make your bones strong. It's not pushing away from God. It's actually drawing near to God. But whenever you experience betrayal and hurt and pain in your life, all of us, we push away. I know people that are pushing away right now, and, and I, I can see it. I can see the patterns in their life when I don't see them for a while because, because these hurts, these pains, they cause us to want to push away. But the only way to heal broken trust is faithful trust. God doesn't want you to push away. He wants you to draw near. Sometimes we, we instead of fearing God and, and, or drawing near to God, we, we end up drawing near to evil instead. We, we draw near to things that, that we think will help us, that are wise in our own eyes. Well, if I just isolate myself, then I'll be better. Is isolation, do you think that's from God? No, that's not from God. <laughs> but but or we draw to, near to things that we think will, will help us to, to make us feel better in the moment. 
those aren't things that aren't from God. So we're, we're prone to push away God and draw near to evil, but this verse is saying, and he's saying, to my son, don't draw away, don't draw away, draw near to God, push near to God, learn to trust him, don't be wise in your own eyes, have respect for the Lord. See, this is the, 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 the thing that, that I see in this, and it's hard because we say like, oh yeah, I'm not wise in my own eyes, but, but we are. Because we're following our heart sometimes. And, but the problem with a betrayed heart is, is when your heart has betrayed you, right? When your heart has been betrayed, it will betray you whenever, whenever you follow it. If your heart's been betrayed, that's just going to keep showing up in your life. The only way to heal a betrayed heart is to look outside yourself. You can't do this on your own. You have to trust God. It has to be impressed and pushed down on your life. But the wisdom, your own wisdom, it causes us to push away. And now Solomon's going to move to another thing that, that causes us to be wise in our own lives, to, to look after our own security, to look after ourselves, to make sure that we're okay. And he moves on to the idea of money. This is what he says to his son. He says, now honor the Lord with your wealth, with the first fruits of all your crops. Then your barns will be filled to overflowing and your vats will brim over with new wine. A, a lot of times... People quote this verse, but not in the context of, of this section. And, and even when we hear money talked about in church, a lot of times we almost assume, like, oh, they're just after my money, right? But, but when we put this in the context of this verse, this verse is spoken by Solomon, one of the richest guys that ever lived. Do you think he said this because he was worried about money? No. This verse isn't just about money. Solomon knew that, that, that finances, they, they, they cause us to focus on our own safety, our own protection, our own security. See, the, the world tells us that our finances are all about us, but God says over and over that your finances are all about trust. How you spend your money is all about trust. The world says, make sure and look after yourself. God says, no, no, no. How you approach money, it's all about trust. And Solomon, he wants to pass this on to his son because he knows his son is going to be prone to trusting his own wisdom, which is going to push him away from others and push him away from God. And he wants to help him to see a discipline that he can put into practice in his life to help guard his heart, to protect his heart from this. And the discipline he speaks of is the disciplines of giving of your first fruits. And it's, a, it's something that we see repeated over and over also in Scripture. He talks about... In, in, in the Old Testament, this is the discipline of the, the tithe, too. It's not just a concept. It's something that you put into practice. There's actually a percentage to it, right? Because we're prone to tricking ourselves in this, right? And, and he's saying you got to have a discipline in your life where you put God first with your finances. Because this is about trust. Because otherwise, you're going to end up not trusting in God and trusting in your own wisdom. And this was a very practical way that we can understand this. And, and we get this. There's a, another verse in Timothy. It says this, the love of money is the roots of all kinds of evil. Some people, people eager for money, they've wandered away from the faith. They've pierced themselves with many griefs. We've seen how evil money can be. The problem is we just imagine, but not me. It couldn't happen to me. And so sometimes we're very undisciplined in our own lives in regards to money because we think we're immune to this, but we're not. Not even Solomon's son was immune to this. No one is immune to this. Put practices in your life to guard your heart because it will allow you to let the loving kindness of God impress on your heart. It will help you understand that, that, that when you look around the world and we focus on our money and us, all of a sudden things are, it's always scarce. There's never enough, right? We, we, know, we wonder how we're going to get the next paycheck. But whenever you start to, to trust God with it, I promise and the only way to see this is to try it. It's going to change your perspective. You're going to start to see that, wow, there's actually more than enough. Rather than looking at, at things as scarce, you'll start to see the abundance of God overflowing. That's what this is talking about, barns that are just overflowing. It's talking about this, this new wine. And this new wine is, is foreshadowing the newness that Christ brings. Because the interesting thing is that just as God asked us to bring our first fruits, he does the same. He gave up his first fruits, Jesus, for us. His overwhelming generosity, he wants to pour it out into our lives. Why? Because this isn't about finances, it's about trust. It's about the character, the loving kindness, the commitment, the truth of God from beginning to end, everything that he is being pressed down on your heart. 
And when that happens, it changes you. It makes your path straight. It overflows into every single aspect of your life. But we push against it. And I think this, this last verse really, even for me, this, this challenges my heart. This is what he says. My son, do not despise the Lord's discipline. Do not resent his rebuke. Because the Lord disciplines those he loves as a father, the son he delights in. Do you push towards discipline and rebuke? Or do you distance yourself from it? Do you push away from it? I, I remember a time in college, um, I was praying with a friend of mine. I think we were going on a trip, right? And uh, he prays as you often do, going on a trip, like the normal things. I mean, let's be honest, some of our prayers, they're like the same every time, right? Like, God, look after us, keep us safe on our journey, you know, watch us, ma- make sure that we, you know, are safe on the road. I mean, we were praying for all these things, but then all of a sudden he prayed for something that was like totally outside of what I was expecting. He said these words, he says, Lord, discipline me harshly. But actually he said, discipline us harshly. That's what he said. So I'm praying with him, and he said, discipline us harshly. Uh, us harshly, and my heart went, uh, God, can you just make that him? Like, the us in that? Like, there was something in my heart that the idea of being disciplined harshly by God, I pushed back from that, and there still is something in my heart that, that sometimes pushes back from discipline, from rebuke. God, actually, just be really gentle with me, right? But what amazing faith and trust in God does it, does it, does it bring out in our lives when we say, God, I actually desire your discipline. I desire correction. See, this requires us to trust in something greater than ourselves, beyond our own wisdom, and that is hard. See, ultimately, God is bringing us to to trust in something, Him, outside of ourselves, a power far greater, but a lot of times He'll bring you to somebody else, (laughs) somebody in the church, Somebody who, who maybe has something that you don't have yet to, to help you take a small step towards this. But are you pushing away from rebuke and correction? Or are you actually desiring it in your life? It tells you a lot about where your heart's at. Do you want God to impress on his character, his loving kindness on your heart? When you do it, it makes your path straight. He, he wants to discipline us because he loves us and he wants what's best for us. So that's where I, I want us to finish off kind of just doing a little bit of a heart check. Where are we at with this? See, a lot of times we come to church and we say, yeah, I believe in Jesus. You know, I, I trust him. Do you? Do you trust him? In this verse, it causes us to look at it different ways and to challenge ourselves, look at ways that we can trust them. And, and, and here's the thing, though. We're, 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 we're prone to make all this about us as an individual. This isn't just about you as an individual. This impacts our relationships with God and each other. Like earlier when it says that don't be wise in your own eyes, has respect for the Lord, this will bring health to your body. It will make your bones strong. It's not talking just about your body. It's talking about the body talking about this will give us structure as a church as we allow God to impress on our heart it will impact your relationships with each other don't just think about this between you and God talk about it with somebody this week if you really want to 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 have him impress in your heart don't do it alone don't do it in secret do it with his people let me read this out to you again Proverbs 3 1 through 4 it says this my son don't forget my teaching but keep my commands in your heart because they will prolong your life many years. They'll bring you peace and prosperity. Let love and faithfulness never leave you. Bind them around your neck. Write them on the tablet of your heart. Then you will win favor. You will experience the grace of God. Favor and a good name in the sight of God and man. And man. So we're going to go into a time of communion. And I want to give you, um, I'm going to put this, this last slide up on here. And if you want, take a picture of this so you can look it out of your phone, even as you're taking communion. But let's go through and do a bit of a heart check. Where are we at with this? See, God in his wisdom, he gave himself for us, right? The first fruits, the generous, he gave of it his only son because he wants us to trust him. He wants to impress his love and kindness in our lives. It's, it's dearly loved children. He wants us to follow in his example Because if you allow that to impress on your life, it will flow out into every single aspect of your life. 
And so my encouragement is take these words this week, go back and read it, and talk about it with God, but also talk about it with somebody that you trust. Bring up somebody in the church, say, hey, I want to meet up, I want to talk about this. Talk about it with somebody. Let's let God change our hearts. Let's let God change our hearts. Would you pray with me, and then we're just going to take communion, and we're going to remember God's loving kindness to us. God, your love endures forever. I'm sitting at this room, and, um, and I'm looking out at, at people's faces, and I can see, God, that, that all of us are, we have so many different things that have been impressed in, on our hearts, so many different places, and, and yet your loving kindness comes after each one of us. It endures past all things. There's nothing that anyone has done in this room that is bigger than your love. Your loving kindness it endures forever, forever and ever. God, you are true. The truth is, is that you love us even though we don't deserve it. The truth is, is that you love us enough to send your son to die for us. You've loved us from the beginning to the end. God, would your truth, would you just imprint that on our lives? Allow us to, to live that out. God, we can't do this on our own. We need you for this. Stamp your character, your love, and your kindness on our hearts. God, thank you for your sacrifice, and thank you that you rose again, that we can talk with you right now. Jesus, we trust you. God, help us to live this out in our lives. It's in Jesus' name I pray. Amen.